No matter what else is happening in the world. There is always good news today. Welcome to Good News Today, the program where you will always find good news no matter what else is happening in the world. I'm Mark Teske, your host for Good News Today. I want to thank you for joining us. This morning, we'd like to begin by welcoming our viewers in the Atlanta area. Today marks the first broadcast for us on WATC, and we're thankful to be able to present the good news to you each and every week. We've got a great program today, and here's what's coming up. We'll begin with our devotional time, as we always do, and that consists of our scripture reading, beautiful singing, and a brief study of that scripture. Today, we'll be looking at John chapter 4, verses 23 and 24, where Jesus talks about worship during the New Testament age. Please get out your Bibles and turn to John 4, and I'll meet you right there in just a moment. Following our devotional time, Freddie Clayton joins us, and he's talking about a very sensitive subject and highlighting the beauty of human life. Jim Dearman's in the studio, and he's got some sound words as he looks into the future in a biblical way. We'll hear about that in just a few moments. Then Roger Campbell is back, and he's answering the question, what's the difference between elders and deacons? In our final segment, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin will be answering the question, does Proverbs 22.6 guarantee that our children will be faithful if we do a good job of raising them? Well, I hope you have your Bibles open up to John 4, where we read together. But the hour is coming, and now is, when the true worshipers will worship the Father in spirit and truth, for the Father is seeking such to worship Him. God is spirit, and those who worship Him must worship in spirit and truth. John chapter 4, Jesus is passing through Samaria, and He stopped at Jacob's well. The disciples who were traveling with Him went into the city to buy some food. And while Jesus was sitting there at the well, a Samaritan woman came out, and He asked that Samaritan woman for a drink of water. And this strikes up a conversation between the two of them. And during that conversation, Jesus miraculously tells her about her marital situation. And in doing that, this woman realizes that Jesus is a prophet. 
she then asked Jesus a question about worship. You see, at the time, Jews and Samaritans worshiped in different places. Samaritans worshiped on that mountain uh, that was nearby, Jews there at the temple in Jerusalem. And this is one of many points of differences between the two people. Uh, but she wants Jesus' inspired thoughts on the matter. Where are we to worship? Which brings us to our text for today. Jesus tells her that uh, the hour is coming and now is. Uh, what he's saying there is, is worship is about to undergo a change. You see, Jewish worship was regulated by the Old Testament law. But that law was about to come to a close. You see, the fact that worship is changing requires that the law is also about to change. And he's telling the Samaritan woman, don't bother quarreling about what is about to go away. But rather, you need to concern yourself with the worship of today. So there's a difference between Old Testament worship and New Testament worship. And Jesus is saying that very clearly here in this passage. He tells her that true worshipers will worship in spirit and in truth. When he says to worship in truth, that means according to the New Testament law, the New Testament pattern. Jesus said in John 17, 17, sanctify them by your truth. Your word is truth. So when we worship in truth, it means we're worshiping according to the New Testament. In addition, true worshipers are to worship in spirit. This means having the proper heart, a proper attitude in worship. When we have the proper attitude in worship, we're not going to be criticizing those who are leading in the worship. You see, that's not the right attitude. The way we should evaluate our worship is, is not by what I get out of it, but what I give. That's the process of worship. It's not a getting uh, process. It's a giving process. And when we worship in spirit, that's a life-changing experience. You see, proper worship is, is actually approaching the throne of God. And you cannot do that and not be affected by it. It's going to change the way you look at life. It'll change your priorities completely. What does this worship in spirit and truth look like? Well, one who's worshiping in spirit is going to be a liberal, cheerful giver. Romans 12, 8, 2 Corinthians 9, 7. They're going to be singing joyfully, Ephesians 19, James 5, 13. They're going to give thankful, meaningful prayers, Philippians 4, 6, James 5, 16. And when it comes time for the preaching and the scripture reading, they're going to be listening attentively, 1 Timothy 4, verse 12. And when it comes time to partake of the Lord's Supper, they'll do that reflectively, 1 Corinthians 11, 27 through 30. You see, the Father is seeking such to worship Him. We need to give God what He wants, not what we want. When we understand this principle, we'll seek authority for everything we do in worship. And notice he says we must worship Him in spirit and in truth. It's not optional. It's a must. So as we consider our worship, we don't look to the Old Testament for worship instructions. Jesus said, no, don't do that. That's changing. We need to know the focus and strive to please Him, not ourselves. And being able to please God is good news for us today. Now, Freddie Clayton is going to be talking about a very sensitive topic, and he's reminding us how precious life really is. I saw this headline a while back. Down syndrome in Iceland is disappearing. The headline is shocking. Down syndrome is virtually disappearing in Iceland. More accurately, people with Down syndrome are being eliminated in Iceland through abortion. As prenatal testing becomes more and more widespread across the world, the number of babies born with Down syndrome and other conditions has decreased because when parents opt for screening that reveals an abnormality, 
many opt to end the pregnancy. Down syndrome happens when a person has an extra chromosome, which alters development and physical traits and increases the risk for medical conditions like heart defects and hearing deficiencies. Life expectancy of a person with Down syndrome was only 25 years old back in 1983. But now, just a few decades later, life expectancy has dramatically increased to 60 years old. The National Down Syndrome Society points out that people with Down syndrome can attend school, they can work, they can have meaningful relationships, they can vote, they can contribute to society in many wonderful ways. Quality educational programs, a stimulating home environment, good health care, and positive support from the family, friends, and community enable people with Down syndrome to lead fulfilling and productive lives. In the United States, we don't know exactly how many pregnancies are terminated following a prenatal diagnosis of Down syndrome and other conditions because the data is not collected. But other countries track prenatal diagnosis and abortion data. And the results are quite telling. According to CBS News, the United States has an estimated termination rate for Down syndrome of 67%. In France, it's 77%. In Denmark, 98%. In Iceland, more than four out of five women have a prenatal screening who receive a positive test for Down syndrome, they choose to abort their child. According to the National Down Syndrome Society, about 6,000 babies are born with Down syndrome every year in the United States. Now just imagine if nearly 100% of those people had been aborted instead. What happens when a person's perceived quality of life becomes more important than the value of life itself? Down syndrome and other conditions don't negate the inherent dignity and worth of a person, born or unborn. Our dignity and worth as human beings doesn't lie in our characteristics or our capabilities. Life is the most basic human freedom of all. Advancing the fundamental truth in public policy and day-to-day -day interactions with our neighbors will hasten the day that every human being from the moment of conception, is protected in law and welcomed in life. Friends, God still considers an abomination, hands that shed innocent blood. Proverbs chapter 6, verse 17. This is Freddie Clayton, walking and talking in the light. Abraham Lincoln said, No man stands so tall as when he stoops to help a child. May we have that attitude and approach to the children and the most vulnerable among us. Now grab some paper and something to write with, and you can write down our contact information. If you haven't enrolled in our free Bible correspondence course, contact us and get started. Remember, all of our courses are given absolutely free of charge. We won't try to sell you anything, and we won't pester you with solicitations. After that, Jim Dearman will be with us right after this brief break. You may have questions or comments about Good News Today. We'd like to hear from you. Or if you would like to receive free Bible study materials, please contact us. Our mailing address is Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. Again, that's Good News Today, P.O. Box 206, Dunlap, Tennessee, 37327. You may prefer to email us at goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. That's goodnewstodaytv at gmail.com. Or call us toll-free at 1-877-384-7221. That's 1-877-384-7221. We'd like to hear from you. Hearing from our audience is always good news to us. Well, I hope you got down our contact information. If you didn't get it, you can get it from our website, gnttv.org. While you're there, you can see past programs and segments on demand. Just click on Archived and Current Programs at the top of the page. 
Now Jim Dearman has some sound words for us as he looks into the future. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Many people feel they would be happy if they knew what the future held for them. But knowing the future might not be as pleasant as some believe. The story is told about French King Louis XI, who had mistakenly placed his faith in astrology. He was deeply impressed when on one occasion an astrologer correctly guessed that a lady of the court would die in eight days' time. But the king decided such a man could be dangerous, so he decided to kill him by having his servants throw the prognosticator out the window at the king's signal. When the astrologer arrived at the king's apartments, the king asked him this question, Tell me, how long you have to live? The astrologer immediately answered, I shall die just three days before your majesty. The shaken monarch immediately canceled his plans to bring about the astrologer's death. <laughs> the Bible tells us no man knows what the future holds. However, we do know who holds the future. The key is to be ready when the Lord returns, whenever that may be. We will live eternally if we obey sound words. Thanks for those excellent thoughts, Jim. We have a free app for your phone. Just go to the App Store, download it there for free. We also have a channel on Roku and Apple TV. You can also hear Good News Today on Truth.fm, which is a group of internet radio stations streaming 24-7. There's a station there dedicated to good news today. Now Roger Campbell is here to explain to us the difference between elders and deacons. Be ready always. In the Bible, we read about a group of Christians who are called the elders of the church. In the New Testament, we also read about Christians who are called deacons. What's the difference? How would you go about answering that question? From a biblical perspective, What's the difference between elders and deacons? They're mentioned together in Philippians chapter 1 and verse 1. The word here is not the word elders, it's the word bishops, but it's the same individuals. In Philippians 1 and verse 1, the Bible says, Paul and Timotheus, the servants of Jesus Christ, to all the saints in Christ Jesus, which are at Philippi, with the bishops. And deacons. And so, yes, the Bible does speak about those individuals, and here they're mentioned together. In the English Bible, the only other passage in which we have the word deacon is found there in 1 Timothy chapter 3, verses 8 through 13. So, so what's the difference between a deacon and an elder? Well, when you look at the Greek words, from which we get our English word elder and deacon, it's different words. The Greek word for elder is the word presbyteros, which talks about a person who is older, or it can be one who has the specific role that's called an elder of the church. Well, the word deacon comes from a Greek word diakonos, which means a servant. One who has the task of carrying out someone else's instructions. Now, elders are also called by other names. In Acts chapter 20 and verse number 17, we learn that while Paul was in one city, he sent and called for the elders of the church of Ephesus to come to him, and they came. And as Paul was speaking with those elders from Ephesus, he reminded them. He said, you need to take heed to yourselves. You take heed to all the flock over which the Holy Spirit has made you overseers to feed or shepherd the church of God which he hath purchased with his own blood. So they're in that setting in Acts 20, verse 17 and 28. We learn that the elders are also called overseers or bishops and they are recognized as being shepherds. So in the New Testament, the elders of the church, they're the bishops, they're the overseers, they're the shepherds, 
They're the pastors. But what's the difference? Well, the difference between elder and, and deacon would be, number one, there's a difference in their qualifications. You can read the requirements for those brothers who are going to serve as elders or bishops. You can read that in Titus 1 and 1 Timothy 3. And the requirement for a brother is going to be a deacon. You read that in 1 Timothy 3. So a difference in qualifications, a difference in roles. Elders are charged to shepherd the flock. Deacons are charged to serve the flock. And then there's a difference in their authority. The elders are responsible to take care of the church of God, 1 Timothy 3 and verse 5, and they oversee it. Deacons don't oversee. They're under the oversight of those elders. Thank God for godly elders and godly deacons. I'm Roger King, and this has been Be Ready Always. Wouldn't it be great to start every day with time in the Word of God? We've got a podcast designed to do that very thing. The Good News Today Daily Devotional Time podcast is available wherever you get your podcasts. In just a moment, Guyton Montgomery and Troy Spradlin will be with us. Now, Guyton and Troy, repair our understanding about Proverbs 22.6. Does this passage guarantee that our children will be faithful if we do a good job of raising them? You know, Troy, a lot of people have difficulty when it comes to reading their Bibles daily. Have, have you encountered that as a preacher, people asking you, you know, how can I be a better Bible student? Oh, yes, that's a very common thing. Uh, does somebody starting out reading one of the things I, I heard this years ago that I, I just thought was really, really interesting is that there's 31 chapters in the book of Proverbs. And so to encourage somebody to, that if you will read a chapter a day, every day, that you will be able to read the entire book of Proverbs in a month. Now, sometimes you have to read two chapters on that last day, or if it's that February, <laughs> you might have to read three, or, right. but, but but it's a great way to get somebody to read in their Bible. And so I, I did that for several months in a row and I loved it. And, um, every now and then I'll challenge myself to that again, because Proverbs is one of those books that whenever I get done reading, I'm, I'm just always encouraged to, to live my life better. Yes. Yes. It's a great book for that very reason. It's uh, those antidotes of, of how to live your life. It's, and it's not take away from any other book of the Bible, but it's one that's so in my opinion, uh, easier to understand and apply um, the lessons. They just jump out at the page. But they also leave you asking some questions. And we got a question that came in from the book of Proverbs. Okay. It wants to know, does Proverbs 22, 6 guarantee that our children will be faithful if we do a good job of raising them? And so, <laughs> excellent question. Uh, let's read the verse. It says, train up a child in the way he should go, and when he is old, he will not depart from it. So to answer this question, does it guarantee that our children will be faithful? The simple answer is no. Uh, I wish it did, but that's not exactly what it's saying. There. Yeah. The book of Ecclesiastes kind of tells the book that comes after it. Ecclesiastes kind of takes that away. Doesn't it? There are no guarantees. <laughs> exactly. And one of the greatest principles we have to understand in this is that there is a thing called free will that God has given us that, that even though as a parent at times I have two sons, I would love to kind of be able to control them. Ultimately I cannot, 
Um, they still have free will. They have to make their decisions rather to follow after God or not. And there are going to be a lot of influences in their life beyond my influence. Uh, when they go to school, when they go to workplace, when they, um, date, when they get married, uh, there's so many friends that they have and there are so many variables that could come into play when it comes to the, to whether, um, whether or not they're going to choose to follow after God. Exactly. But it doesn't take away the principle of what he's teaching here. No. The, the principle is, is that you have a great bearing as a parent about your children believing in God or not. And that's why in Romans chapter one, it talks about the idea of unrighteousness, being disobedient to parents. You as a parent, you have the responsibility to make sure that your children learn the principles of answering to authority. Uh, because what is Christianity all about? Learning to submit to God. Mm -hmm. And if you can't learn to submit to a parent, are they going to learn to submit to God? So, um, you know, you have the greatest influence on this, but unfortunately you don't have the only influence. That's exactly right. And I think Jesus teaches that in the parable of the seed and the sower, you know, there's one source and that's exactly what's being said in Proverbs. There's one source of truth. There's one source of, of, of what we need to be doing, but it doesn't mean everybody is going to follow that. And so he gives four different scenarios in the seed and the sower principle uh, or parable there, the principles that are in there and not everybody's going to follow. But the point is that you were making earlier is that we still need to plant that seed in our children we need to try to do everything we can to water it and nurture it. And, you know, to me, that, that verse kind of reflects in my own life is I kind of wandered away for a little while, but that seed was there and eventually it, it, you know, it came out and then I came back to the Lord. And so that verse came true in my own life. I think the parable of the prodigal son That's brings this one. out mm -hmm. that, that sometimes even when you raise your children, right, they can make that free will choice to go pursue on unrighteousness or serve Satan for a while, but, um, don't hold out hope because your influence upon them, teaching them, showing them what it is to love God, that there's hope that they can return. That's what the verse is Amen. trying to teach us. Thank you so much for spending time with us today. And for those of you in Atlanta, we hope you come back again next week. We love to hear from our audience. Contact us and Sign up for one of those Bible correspondence courses or ask us a question. We might just answer it on the program. Thanks for being with us.